This is an eight iron, and it's a dead shank. Wow. Way right. Oh, Takes a hop shank. off the paddle. You gotta be kidding me. Very tough pitch shot right here. You gotta hit it into the hill. One hop up and bite, and it's in. Kind of like that. I would like to welcome four-time DP World Tour winner. I guess pro, we have to call it that now versus the European Tour. I still want to call it the Euro- European Tour, but Matthias Gronberg, yeah. it is uh, it is an honor to have you on the Sub-70 podcast. So thanks for joining us, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you so much. I look forward to it as well. All right, so we'll get into the, you know, a little bit of a open preview. You've played St. Andrews, you figure, a hundred times in competitive rounds, so we can te- you know, definitely talk about that side of it. I think your perspective would be interesting. But, you know, let's start with your career a little bit. So when I introduce you as a four-time winner, and you know how hard it is to win out there, not once, not twice, but three times, to do it four times, kind of looking back at, at, at your career on the DP World Tour, how, how proud are you of that, of you know, being a multiple tour winner and the sort of level of respect from the other players that comes with that when you've won that many times out there? I'm definitely proud over it. But at the same time, I look back on my career and think uh, <clears throat> I had the golden opportunity. Two of my first events that I won gave me five-year exemptions on tour. And I think I messed around a little bit too much with my swing and, and trying different things. So I didn't win as many times as I would have loved to have done. But otherwise, four times, is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty good career. Yeah, right. I mean, if you actually look how many people have four wins, right, or multiple wins. And I think, yeah. I think it's also different. It's like from my conversations with other tour players, there is a level of respect, right? If you're a one-time winner, okay, you did it. You back it up a couple more times. I think there's a, you're, you're, you're on a different tier. Would you say it's a true statement when, when from from the other players, your peers per se? I I, I think so. Uh, I, I think so, and I, I kind of know so that it's the same with me. The way I look at other people's career, and uh, the main thing that I look at is longevity. How long have you been playing as well? So guys like Richard Bland, even though he now has a, <clears throat> only one win in his career but he's been out there for 25 years or right. so. Uh, or, and and I, I looked upon that with respect as well because it's so hard to stay on tour. Yeah, and and I always say, like, that's, uh, you know, it shows the level of excellence of your career. Like you said, take Richard Bland, who, you know, I would say he's a great player to be able to do it for that long and still to be competitive in his late 40s like that, right? Consistently competitive. Yeah. There's... I know he didn't win probably as much as he wanted to, but I would say, you know, the the difficulty in that, exactly what you're saying, of being relevant for that long, right? There's there's no one else out there for 25 years that's taken his car. He's been that good. That's It's it's a crazy yeah. accomplishment at some level. It's sort of like, you know, over on the PGA Tour, you know, like Charles Howell III, right? You think, well, yeah, a couple, two or three wins, but my God, he's like, you know, he's made two and a half to three million dollars for 25 years straight. He's like a, he's like an ATM, you know, and to be that good yeah, for that yeah. long, it's it's impressive, you know. I agree with you on your statement of some of those players get overlooked for their longevity standpoint from that, you know, of how long they've done it for. What I'm most impressed with Charles Howell is that he actually came back. I think he had one or two years where he was really struggling, and then he came back on tour and now playing really good. He, and that's that's also a sign of of uh, like. It's it's really impressive what he's done. Also, with that win a couple of years ago, late in his career, right? Now, I know he's just start yeah. playing better and come back. He wins again. I mean, it's it's yeah. hard. Um, a really interesting one too. I had to read this twice when uh, when you won the Smurfette European Open, and I was looking at him like ten shot victory, which, as you well know, is an anomaly, right? I mean, that the, the competition yes. you play against is so good, no one usually wins by ten. What, what magic did you find that week, and how much fun is it to play, you know, nine holes to go with that sort of a lead? And in, in, was that one of those just magical weeks where just everything was easy and just sinks up, and it's like, you know, uh, it all comes together sort of in one tournament? Yeah, it, it, it was quite incredible because I wasn't playing that well coming into the tournament, but I had a 
Peter Harrison from Callaway Golf at the time. He took he took a look on my swing and, and said, oh, maybe put the ball back a little bit in the stands, like almost two inches further back. And then everything started clicking. I was playing great golf. I was in the lead by 10 shots after with nine holes left to play. And uh, largely due to my main rival, Craig Hainline, unfortunately double bogeyed eight and nine. But so suddenly I had a 10 shot lead uh, and it, it was incredible. I'm a great week and I, I, but uh, I, I give plenty of credit to Peter Harrison. That's for sure. Isn't it interesting how some just little, little thing like that at guys at your level can make that difference of just syncing it up, right? Where you're just maybe slightly off. Yeah. You're making a cut, but you know, you're not in all eight cylinders and all of a sudden, boom, you got it. And it all comes yeah. together. No, it's, it, it it is more 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 so than uh, that happens all the time on tour I think because players are so good and so quite even nowadays uh, that it just it happens that someone is getting a tip or say right now with Rory McIlroy and and uh, Brad Faxon is teamed up and and giving him putting instruction and stuff like that it's just small things that just makes your golf game so much more improved. I was going to ask you, too, about, you know, growing up in Sweden, which, you know, there are professional golfers, you know, from your country. Not as, you know, not a huge contingent, but a lot of good quality players. You know, how did, how did you start playing in Sweden? I'm guessing the season was pretty short. And then when did you sort of know you were good enough where, okay, you know, I'm, I'm going to make a run at this or the talent is there or, or I'm beating the competition as an amateur that I'm ready for that next level? Yeah, so, so what happened, I, I'm born 1970, and in 1987, I went, in 1986, I started a golf school, three years economics with golf on the schedule, and in the winter time, I had the fortune that I could take off from school a little bit and go to Spain. Ah. So I, I went to Spain almost two to three months each year during school year, uh, and practice on my golf. And then later on, when I turned professional, I actually went to PGA West in, in uh, the desert in Palm Springs yep. and, and, uh, and worked on my game there. Uh, so, and I think that's most of the Swedish uh, players that have become good, like Annika uh, and Henrik. And we, we all kind of went down to Spain or, or, Italy, France, or somewhere where the weather is better, or the U.S. And, and then the school in Sweden sort of has that pathway for players with talent like that that they recognize and say, okay, let's let's do the education, but also continue what we see of of you know excellence in a sport. They sort of curtail a schedule for you guys for something like that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, the the thing was, I, I had for comparison for your young listeners is I had three in handicap when I was 13, but then I had five in handicap when I was 14, I was playing a lot more soccer and enjoy that. I was uh, almost fast tracking to the uh, Swedish national boys team in soccer. But then my mom and dad introduced me to this golf school and I got accepted with handicap of five. And I, I think they saw someone who was interested in sports or loved sports. And uh, so I went quickly. Within three months, I went from five in handicap to scratch wow. uh, when I got accepted to the school. So when I entered the school, I was a scratch player at 16 and and just loved it. And, and it was a great education because they, they uh, uh, had some um, kind of guests from the pro ranks come and, and talk to us and talk about the importance of putting and, and the old Swedish players would come in and, uh, and, and give us instruction and stuff like that. It's interesting too. I think from when you got on tour in the European tour in the, in the early nineties, you still had like, I would consider like that, that the stalwarts of back then would be the European tour, right? You had, you had woozy, you had Seve. You had Torrance, Faldo, Monty starting to get into his prime. You know, what, what was the European tour like of that traveling circus sort of, you know, in the in the 90s like that? And then do you have any great Seve stories or woozy stories or guys who would uh, <laughs> go out a little bit every now and then and have a good time? Uh, it, it was 
looking back at it, it it's incredible. And uh, the the camaraderie, uh, basically, we traveled all together. Uh, we were staying in the same hotel, going down to the uh, after in the evening. We would go down to the uh, bar, uh, have a drink or two, and and talk. And there would be stories. And David Ferretti, as we all know, is like. He's an entertainer, and uh, Sam Torrance, uh, great stories, uh, like fun, fun things that snippets that or stories that I have over the years. Like Sam Torrance, for instance, he would always walk and look down on his feet, and I was like, "What, what are you doing, Sam? You're not looking where you go." And and he said, Matthias you're actually the one that is not so smart. You don't want to look forward because you, you, I actually tripped once when I was playing great golf. <laughs> and ever since then, I've, I've always looked where I put my feet. And, and, uh, and then um, Seven Ballesteros, I have uh, many, many cools. To, I, I, played, uh, I didn't play so many tournament rounds with him, but I did play practice round and one year in uh, Paris, uh, Sanom La Bretèche, uh, we uh, we played the nine holes, and he was in every bunker, hitting five to ten bunker shots every bunker, and and there was bunkers that would you would never get even in play, you would never miss a shot to a back bunker with the front pin, but he would practice these shots over and over, and that was kind of funny. Um, and, and the last story with, uh, with seven Ballesteros was I, I was playing the Irish open and I was a rookie and, um, I've had this trick shot, uh, where I put a ball in the mouth and hit it on half volley. And I've done it pretty much. I'm the only pro that I know that, that do this shot. And, um, all the pros knew that I would do it. And the, the range was full. But Seve was just leaving his spot on the driving range. So I was walking up as a rookie. And um, I, I, I sat down and the caddies and the, and the players were all saying like, Matthias, show Seve your trick shot. So I hit this trick shot and I flushed it. It was a great six on, just the way you want with a little spin and beautiful shot. And, and he said, oh, that's pretty good. But he didn't say anything more. I, I was expecting him to show a little bit more emotion, but nothing more than that. And, and Faldo kind of uh, kept to himself a little bit, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, Faldo. So uh, I have a, uh, one more thing with Seve. Uh, just earlier that year uh, in Madrid, I walked into the physio unit once, and Seve was working out. And he actually said my first name. And when he did that, it was like crazy. It's like Mr. Nicholas saying your right. first name. Am I, it's crazy. But Faldo, I have, it, it's, it, it, it's a strange story, but Faldo at the time, he, he wasn't the most friendliest player. I mean, he was quite serious. And, and one time I played the Scottish Open and, um, Faldo was um, playing by himself uh, with no marker. And normally, if you qualify for Saturday or Sunday and you're in the last spot, uh, teeing off early in the morning, you play with a marker. But he didn't have a marker. And uh, we're, we're, we finished our play on, on the Sunday, I think it was. We have finished our uh, game and we're sitting in in the tent at Scottish Open. They had a tent at the temporary clubhouse at Loch Lomond. And I'm sitting with my playing partners, and someone said, oh, did you see Nick Faldo play by himself? And I said, well, that's because no one wants to play with the miserable um, player. Right, right, right. And, 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 and all I hear is like, yeah, you're pretty right. And <laughs> Nick Faldo is sitting right behind me. Oh. Uh, <laughs> And here I am, like a, a, a half rookie at the time. And uh, but Faldo, over the years, he trans. I mean, he's he's become such a great ambassador of the game. Uh, the commentating, I, I've enjoyed it over the years. Um, 
he always had time when you wanted to talk to him and stuff like that. So, but it was funny at that time. <laughs> like yeah, I was new on tour, and I said that it wasn't it wasn't the best from me. <laughs> well, he was just all business, right? I mean, you could just tell. I mean, yeah, that was his personality. Yeah. That's what he had to do to get the. You know, Sevy was charismatic, and you know, played like Sevy and Feldo. Probably to get the most out of what he needed to get out of. That's what he had to be, you know. For yeah, his... and I, I was lucky. This was in the end of his career, where he. That's why he commentated back, and he was able to soak right. it up and still make fun of the situation, kind of. Right, right, right. And, and <laughs> if it would have been him in the past, I don't think he would have even commentated and said anything to me. <laughs> Blinders on. Um... How good was Monty during that run when he won all the Order of Merit titles? Like, I'm sure you played with them. Like, was it just a ridiculous amount of consistency, or what, what was your view of Monty back in his heyday? A few things. Uh, similar to the PGA Tour, the best players sometimes don't play against the, the, the new players or, or the middle-of-the-pack players. They play different field events where there's more money. And that certainly happened a couple of times uh, during Monty's reign, seven-year reign as, a, as, a, as the number one, where he would win the match play, right. the world match play event, and win a million dollars. And at that time, that was like winning five events right. Right, right, uh, right, right. on the European tour in the beginning of the year, where the fields were weak. Um, or, or the the price purses were a little bit weaker, and and that certainly helped. I know like Barry Lane did the same thing one year, and like if you won one of the big events, you you were all set for the whole year. But he certainly he was so good. I uh, I played with him quite a few tournament rounds, and and he was so good. He would. The pin would be four yards off the left side on the, on a long par four where he has like a four iron or five iron left. He would aim left and fade it into the pin. That much confidence and that was going to happen every time. That much confidence. That much confidence in in his fade at the time. It was scary, and he would uh, he he was premier with his. A little bit unorthodox swing uh, or old style swing. He was dead straight with it as well. He hit so many fairways, and and that's why he he was just hard to beat. Yeah, kind of. I think about his game back in the heyday. It's sort of like he had zero weakness, right? He was long enough. He great iron player. Great. I mean, he was just good. He was just good. He was just good. And am I uh, the? And I, I do think one thing, he never won on the PGA Tour or struggled in the, in the majors because the course setup was so different. I struggled in my career. My best finish in the major has been 18th. I struggled when I get, got on the PGA Tour. I didn't do as, uh, play as good as I, I wanted there as well. The golf courses on the PGA Tour is so much harder to get up and down if you're short side, you're short side yourself. On the, on the European Tour, the DP World Tour, at the time when we played, me and Colin, the, you could get up and down from everywhere if you were skilled. And I think that hurt his career. Like he, he was he was so used to fairly easy golf courses and then would get on the, like a, a Memorial or a, a Muirfield or TPC yeah. Sawgrass. It's like, it's night and day. It's not even, it's not the same golf at all. What, what, what prompted you with, you know, you had success in Europe to come over and, and, and try to play the PGA tour. What was the sort of, you know, we've talked a little bit about the differences and, and you, you played quite a bit over here, but what was that, what was that uh, inspiration to want to go do it where you were kind of, you know, one could argue you had a really nice, you know, you're, you're living in Monaco, you're playing the TP world tour. Life is pretty good. What, what, you know, why did, uh, or what was it about coming over here that kind of made you want to do it for lack of a better word? Yeah, I, I, I tried uh, seven times or eight, eight, seven or eight tries uh, in the Q school 
to get on the PGA Tour. I always wanted to play because I wanted to play against the best players in the world. And, and at that time, it was definitely a big difference from the DP World Tour and, and the PGA Tour uh, in status. The best players in the world played the PGA Tour, and that's where I wanted to go. Uh, and then in 97, I met my American wife. And we and I, together with her, we, we were dreaming about getting on the PGA Tour and then uh, played and, and was fortunate then in 2003 to win the Q School uh, after seven or eight tries uh, and get on the PGA Tour. So would you go play Q School knowing you were still exempt, obviously, on the European Tour back then? So there was kind of you could free, free roll it a little bit where you had that freedom? Yes. Yeah, okay. So that makes a little and, bit and easier. I, I, would, I would do that. Every year I knew that I was exempt, fully exempt for the DP World Tour. Uh, one year it was frustrating because I would play our final event in Spain and finish third one year. I remember it was so annoying because I finished third. I was a top 10, top 20 player on the, on the uh, order of merit for the year. And uh, I went to play... And I missed the Q school second stage even that year, I think. And it was like, oh, I can't believe I did this. Another year wasted, kind of. And um, so, but um, it all came out in, in 2003 when I won uh, after missing for so many years. And then uh, at the time, my son Van, my firstborn uh, son Van was two years old. And uh, so, or one and a half. And that was a, quite an, an, uh, a big reason why I really, really wanted to get on the PGA Tour as well, was the, the daycare that, that we have on the tour. Yeah, how good they take the play, care of the players on that standpoint and traveling yeah. and all that and accommodations, yeah. Um, Monaco, I have to ask you about this. What a cool place <laughs> to live. Like, you lived in Monaco. Like, how much, first off, like, how cool was that? Like, what a dream to live in Monaco. And is it sort of a lifestyle that you think it would be of, you know, European football players, F1 drivers, the, you know, the elegance that comes with that, that country and, you know, the ambiance? Yeah, no, it, it was incredible. Uh, I, I was very fortunate. I met several sports people as I had, uh, like Bjorn Borg, uh, Sergei Bubka, who was a pole vault world champion from Russia. He lived there, uh, had a good conversation with him, but, but, uh, a good friend of mine, Marco van Basten was like a God in soccer or foot, football in, in Europe, uh, for AC Milan. And, um, he, he was a very good friend of mine. Uh, and we, Monaco was just magical. It's Disneyland for grownups. And if if you ever travel to Europe, you you want to put Monaco on that list to places to visit for sure. Yeah, you know, I, you know, to see a Formula One race there for that weekend or something like that would be like bucket list, right? Like how how cool would that be? Of you know, you just think it's just... yeah, and it, it, it's so magical because I, I remember my first Monaco race. I was twenty two, so it was before I moved there. Uh, I was sitting up on the palace mounds uh, on the mountain in in clay and or dirt, and it was raining, but it was fun. It was it was it was just so much fun to watch and listen to these cars racing around Monaco. And then yeah. later on, as I progressed, I, I actually had um, was a a, fr- a good friend of mine was very good friends with Ron Dennis, the the. Uh, the manager of the Mercedes McLaren team. So I was in the pits one year and, and did the whole VIP experience, which was uh, fantastic. How cool is that? How cool is that? Yeah. Well, open championship. We are, we are, you know, a couple of weeks away from it. And this is, we were talking earlier um, about like you've played, you've played the, uh, the great golf course, St. Andrews, over a hundred times or right around that you think. So you've got experience out there. So my first question is on the subject, what makes St. Andrews great? And, you know, where do you kind of place it in, in, in the golf courses you have played of? Where is it as it ranked near the top at the top? And, and what does it take to play well on that golf course? 
it's my number one golf destination kind of experience. Uh, that's number one. And, and number two for me is Pebble Beach area. I love the ocean. Unfortunately, St. Andrews, is you don't really see the water when you play. So that's a little bit of a miss. But I love the golf course. Uh, the golf course is so different from any other golf course that you do play. That's a big reason why it's it's high up on my list. But then the whole thing that you finish in town, you start in town and finish in town uh, with that majestic clubhouse uh, that the RNA have. It, it just makes the feeling. And then obviously for me, all the memories that I have playing there, like Open Championship in 95, I played the, um, the, the World Cup in teams uh, against the U. I played uh, Lee Westwood one year and... Uh, an incredible thing. I was one down with, uh, uh, sorry, I was two down with uh, two holes to play, and I birdied 17 and 18, and then birdied the first playoff hole on one to win. Well, birdie on 17, uh, that's a good birdie. That's a good birdie, yeah. And, and Lee Westwood uh, had, unfortunately, his putt uh, lipped out from 20 feet, and I made my putt from 15 feet, and it was the hard pin position. Right between the bunk, where it's as most the most narrow uh, yeah, point, yep. maybe three quarters up the the green, and then uh, <laughs> on eighteen, I actually hit the road, but it bounced and came in bounds, and then I chipped and putted to make the birdie. So that was kind of, uh, <laughs> I was lucky, let's say that, and skillful at the same time. But I also played Tiger Woods there. He. He had 12 one putts in to start our game, our match, and uh, he won easily. Uh, but uh, it, it was pretty cool. You've played with Tiger at St Andrews. Yeah. Yes. How yeah. how was that experience like? Besides him having 12 one putts, well, like it was just... it was quite a, it was quite annoying. He kept on making putts. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> and, the crowds. And I, was, and... I was probably at I was probably at the time maybe four down or three down after 12 holes. I, I remember I stepped up on 18 being three down. Uh, and then I hit uh, a drive OB on 18 again, like similar to Lee Westwood, but this time it didn't come back. And then I made, so I made a triple bogey or something on the last hole to, to lose by quite a few shots. It was a match play, stroke play, eighteen holes. I got gotcha. you. So it's a different kind of format. How, how, when you was that the first time you played with him? Mm, uh, hold on, uh, that was probably yeah. That was the first time I played with him uh, in the tournament. Yeah. Do, do you remember just thinking, okay, I can, I, I can, you know, play with this guy, or was it like, wow, is this, this is impressive? Like this man can play golf. Even from a professional standpoint, you know, you guys can all play, obviously. But, I mean, was it was it even yeah. a little more special of watching it? It, it was very special because I think I, I think I congratulate him for reaching number one in the world already at that time. It was like 98 or 99 yeah, he's, uh, yeah, he was that there. we played. Yeah. Uh, uh, 98 or 99, he, he had just become number one in the world, I think, at that time, or within six months or something. So I congratulate him for being number one in the world, and then we teed off and played. And uh, one one time, it, it was funny, on hole number seven, I think he was, um, it's a it's a short par four with a valley and, and a, almost like a small ravine uh, before you reach the fairway. And uh, say it's a uh, maybe 230 yards to carry that, uh, and um, 220 to 230. But it was blown so so hard into, and it was so funny. It was definitely a driver for Tiger at the time, but he 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 looked to to fluff his caddy at the time and said, "Oh, uh, what do you think? A chip three wood, like just to chip it out." And, and Fluff said, yeah, okay. And then Tiger stepped up and hit this hardest three wood uh, <laughs> that you can ever imagine just to get over the ravine. But it was, it, it was game. That was game. <laughs> yeah. 
or like just trying to mess with me <laughs> because it was definitely a driver and he just hit the three wood as hard as he could just to get over the ravine <laughs> well then you could you could recognize the ta- i mean he's one of the, number one in the world but even watching it up close as professional to professional i'm assuming you saw the talent and went wow this guy's this guy's pretty damn good yeah i i didn't reflect on it that much there but I must say, I reflected on it, and um, I played the 03, 2003, when Ben Curtis won the Open, and I played with Tiger the third round there, uh, and that was very, very special. It's probably one of my highlights in my golf career, uh, looking back at. Um, I was playing pretty good, and Tiger was playing pretty good, and he started with three birdies, and hold the bunker shot on hole number seven for Eagle. So now he was five under for the day, and he was in the lead in the open. And it's third round. We, I think we had like 30,000 people following. It was 10 to 20 people deep throughout the golf course. It was so much fun. And I said, how much uh, fun is that? We had 80 photographers. Yeah. You're right. I'm just like 80 photographers inside the ropes. That's what you want, right? Like you want to put on a show. Like that's, that's why you put the want. work on. That's you want everyone watching you guys. Like how cool is that? Right? Like yeah, an experience. L- l- luckily, I've always been a player that play better when I have people watching me and I enjoy it. But if you're a player, there's certain pros that don't like to have too many people around watching them when they play. Uh, but luckily, I'm someone who who likes that because it was it was like normally if I would play the Open Championship, I would have maybe five to ten people walking inside the ropes. But with Tiger, it's eighty. It's it's like a mayhem. Yeah, but a great mayhem. But it's a fun mayhem. Exactly, it's a fun yeah. mayhem. That's why you put the work in. That's why heck yeah. Yes. yes, you want that pressure. You want people watching you. Like this is what you do for a living. Yeah. I would have to imagine yeah, and, most and, pros would live for that moment. You'd have to. Yeah, and, and to recap, uh, for Tigers, unfortunately, he played poorly on the back. Uh, he only beat me by one or two shots that day uh, in the end. Uh, and then uh, the fourth day, he did the same thing. He played great the front nine and played poorly the back nine, and he finished third, I think. I finished 18th. Well, you got a good story out of it, and a solid, you know, solid major tournament at Royal St. George's. So, um. yeah, no, no, and uh, and maybe that tournament was uh, more. Why? Why would my best major be Open Championship? Obviously, I played six tournaments or six Opens, but I also that was more the kind of golf courses we played in Europe, right. so it was easier for me. And and at that time, 03 was probably, I know uh, I only won the Italian Open that year, but I also won the Q School later on in the year. So 03 was a year where I, I actually played really, really good golf. Uh, is that the year, too, where you have the uh, Freddie story of just hitting putts on a Tuesday? No, I, 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 the Freddie Couples was the year or two years before that. Uh, Royal St. Anne's, I think we were, or Royal St. Uh It was so fun to meet Fred Couples, was one of my heroes growing up, uh, or like watching the Masters in 92 when he won. And then uh, here I am, and suddenly we, I was walking the front nine, uh, just putting, and, and Fred... Freddie came up and joined me and, and we walked and talked for nine holes and you know how friendly he is. I mean, it was so much fun and, and walking up to each group that we would walk through and putt on the green with them and talk a little bit. And it was, it was so much fun. And that year I actually played with Corey Payman in, in the tournament. So that was fun too. He, he had just, he he won ninety five uh, U.S. Open and I'm a major winner and here I am playing with one of the great players of the game as well. Was Freddie just completely chill like you think he would be? Just kind of Super out there on chill. yeah stroll like just may, hitting some putts, figure it out, saying hi to the boys. Yeah. Like I picture him just like strolling through the day, like not much bothering him, just getting a little work in. Hey boys, how's it going? Like he was exactly how you think he would be. 
Yeah, and and what what I I haven't encountered Freddie that much over my career, but it's nice. Like I just Thursday uh, last Thursday there there was a golf event icon series where twelve sports stars play against twelve rest of the world sports stars U.S. versus rest of the world, and, and Freddie was the captain of the U.S. team, and I stepped up and talked to him a little bit and he recognizes you and talks to you. It's so nice. He's so chill. And then he looks great for his age too, by the way, I want to let everybody know that. <laughs> still playing pretty good <laughs> he, he on the champions like he, tour. He, he looks, he looks like he wants to win again on that champions tour. Well, I think he said he kind of wants one more. I mean, he's definitely, you yeah. know, in his, what is he? 63, 64, right in there. And he still can compete out there. No question about it. Like he's got plenty of length. No, no question. Yeah. He bombs no it still. So, that's that's yeah. Growing up, same thing, you know. I I just idolized Fred Couples and that golf swing, you know, in the '90s of just the coolness and which looked like nothing bothered him and the effortless power. How he just big old shoulder turn and then boom, it's this high power fade. You know, it's just such an elegant way to effortless, elegant way to play golf. You know, back yeah, in, it's, yeah. I, think, uh, I, pl- I played with him. Uh, I think I played with him in U.S. Open in Tulsa, uh, Southern Hills. Yep. Um, which held the PGA this year, but the, at that time it was the U.S. Open, I think, that I played. Uh, and it was so much fun to play with him uh, and reconnect with him at that time. Too. But he, he's, a, he's, a, he's just a great person. Uh, I was going to ask you, too, so back on St. Andrews, you know, like, so I've had, like, two parts. Yeah. Like, how how many rounds does it take for a player to get comfortable out there? Because I haven't played it. I'm actually going this fall to play it. And, you know, everyone says it takes a little bit of time to really get the golf course. So in your opinion, like how many rounds does it take for you to really understand it? And then does it favor a certain player? Is it somebody who chips and putts real well as distance? You know, I think of like Daly winning in 95 and Tiger in 2000, you know, but Zach Johnson won there. It doesn't bomb it. So does, you know, is there a certain kind of player that you think it, that that golf course uh, favors or, you know, or, or a segment of golfers that really kind of has an advantage. Yeah. Um, I, one thing I, I, I think that a player that is able to hit a low draw is always good because it's quite windy sometimes. And if you play with a fade, for me, fade always kind of, it, it just becomes a little bit too spinny shot yep. <laughs> for me personally. So personally, I, I would say someone who can hit a draw would favor. I would favor that in the tournament. Uh, but also, you probably get quite familiar with the golf course after maybe five, six rounds. But it takes longer than that to really, really because the the golf course is played completely different day in and day out with the with the wind. Uh, it's never the same and, course, and it, right? It's the, this bunker is no, not in play, not and now really. it is. And yes, it, that's yeah. the beauty of it. Everyone says, right? Like you, you never could get tired of playing it. Cause it's never the same golf course. It, it's never the same golf course. It's it, it, it really is, and it's there's so many different strategies. Uh, you're coming up on hole number twelve, which is drivable. Um, hole number twelve is normally drivable for the long hitters. Uh, and or sometimes you you know you can't carry the last middle fairway bunker, so are you going to lay up short of all the bunkers or in between? And it, it's every and uh, next hole is a par four where you can choose to go left of the fairway bunkers or right of the fairway bunkers, and or do you blow straight over them, which the long hitters can do. But if you do that, you're in you can run through the fairway into the <laughs> fescue on the other side. So it, it's, it, it really is a great golf course. Uh, and you got to play with what the conditions are giving you daily. And, and that's why the more rounds you have, like 20 rounds, like I, I can see Tiger now probably have at least 30, 40, 50 rounds of golf there. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's, a, a tremendous advantage because you know you can you can kind of oh that's the wind that I was successful to do this kind of hit and this is what I need to do on this hole and stuff. 
in, so, in talking good. about the draw, I mean, right, Zach Johnson plays a draw. Daly in 95 could could draw it if he needed to, no problem. Tiger, you know, could hit all nine shots. So you are there is a pattern of that, if that's what you're saying, like the guys who have won there, right? If you can hit that hard draw yeah. when needed. And I, I, Jordan Spieth, when he played, didn't did Jordan win there? Not there? He did not win there, I don't believe it. He finished second, yeah, yep. maybe or something, second or third or something. But I think he plays draw as well. I think or he can is kind he a of fader? he can work it both ways pretty. I, yeah, I think his. I mean, I think his natural ball flight is a little draw. You know, he kind of holds he, off. He a came off out draw. with a draw. <laughs> yeah. He came out with a draw, and he might be playing more of a fade now. But I, I, I kind of just pictured him as a draw player anyway. So well, I, I think every good player at some point that's their natural ball flight, and then as you, you know, what you, you work the fade in there as the part two. Right, I think every kid yeah. or good player starts off hitting the draw at some point. You got to, and then you sort of learn how to get to just fall to the right. It's sort of the natural yeah. progression. But you know, like you guys can all, tr- you know, if you got most of the guys on it, tour, it, draw, it could be draw. good for Morikawa that he's struggling to hit his fade now, and he hits more of a dead straight ball yeah. with a little bit of a draw. It might be good for him. You never know. Yeah, you know <laughs> but he's, he's but normally, game. anyway, for myself, I've always been quite a high spinner of the ball. So would, when I would play the fade, I would spin it too high, and it would just the wind would take the ball too much. Was your natural ball so, flight a draw normally? Natural was draw. Yeah. Yes, natural type yes. little draw. Well, let's get into the mental side of this, and then because uh, it's a major championship, and I know you've done some coaching and do do coaching with guys on tour. So we're going to go into this major championship, uh, the Open. Is there a different approach mentally? versus a regular tour event, or do you get your guys that you work with to just take it as another week, and this is what we do, and it's the same routine? How do you approach it? It's the same routine. Uh, You might work less, actually, uh, just to not get fatigued and tired, because the mental pressure of a major is quite heavy on you. So if if possible, I, I would suggest to practice less, and not be out there with all the people around you all the time and just decompress and go back to the hotel room and relax a little bit. Or if you rented a house, you go to the house and just relax and chill. And I think that was one of the things that Tiger did so well was he, he didn't practice overly much at, at majors. He, he would just he, – he, it would be uh, – you wouldn't see him almost because he would practice – really early uh, tee off before the galleries are even allowed on the golf course sometimes. And then, and then uh, finish the last nine with a lot of people around and then just out. Yeah. And then Wednesday, like maybe not even be out there, right. Save his energy, save your strength, you know, yes. rest. Yeah. And, uh, but mentally uh, the, the biggest thing that I can take off from playing in majors and that's Bob Rotella. I worked with Bob Rotella for on and off for two, three, four years. And he's a good friend of mine. He had a great strategy. And he's won oh, more than 30, maybe even 40 majors with his players uh, on the mental game. And one of the strategies were to make sure that you don't go after the pin with, say, six on, five on, four on. Don't go and chase the pin hit more middle of the green and then chase the pin and try and make the birdies with your wedge clubs, a pitch and wedge nine on eight on maybe. And then seven on six on, you start playing much more center of the green, almost like a Jim Furyk kind of game plan. Is that hard because you guys see pins and with the talent you guys have, you're like, "Ah, I can, I can squeeze that thing in there. It's fine. Like, is it a hard thing to turn off and be that disciplined? That's, it is hard to do that. And I think the, uh, there's some players that do that strategy, and then some players are just going to say, oh, to heck with it, I'm going to go after everything. Uh, basically, Phil Mickelson's right. style of play. And and that's proven to be successful, too. So it, it's obviously... But, uh, but he's been very, very successful with telling his players this strategy of... of not going after every pin in majors, especially in majors. 
How did you start working on the mental side of coaching versus obviously, you know, golf swing as well versus saying, okay, we're going to work, you know, on the golf swing side. How did you kind of pick that direction? I, it's it's not really a profession for me. It's more uh, of a passion project and stuff. But uh, the got a call from Alex Chaka actually in uh, 2015. I, I've always so what happened was I always had had uh, mental coaches myself. I've had maybe six or seven throughout my career, maybe even up to ten that I've listened to and and taken pointers and stuff. So I have kind of me- melted together a formula for success for me. And I kind of give that kind of golden nuggets to players that I work with and, and help. Uh, but Alex Chaka was kind of funny because uh, he he gave me a call early in the season and said, oh, Matthias, we, we should maybe talk. And, and, and we never did really and, until we connected. I was going to play Puerto Rico on an invite in 2015, and he was playing in the event. So I said, hey, why don't you stay in my hotel room? We, we get to talk a lot and blah, blah, blah. And then I helped him mentally that week, and he won the event after 284 or 294 right. tour events without a victory. So that was kind of like, oh, maybe I'm pretty good at this. <laughs> and then one and, player uh, tells then, the other player, yep, yep, here you go. Yeah, and, and then uh, I helped uh, Christopher Broberg on the, on the European tour, on the DP World Tour, uh, win the BMW Asian Open, uh, and that took three months to get him turned around. And uh, but I I don't work with many players uh, on it, and it's more like uh, I'm still testing my ability and making sure uh, am I really good at this, and I. I it's proven so far that I know what I'm talking about. And, uh, and uh, right now I'm playing, uh, uh, talking to a player on the Champions Tour. Uh, he's struggling with his body. So it's, it's hard. When, when a player is struggling with the body, it's not, you can't override it with good thinking because you, you're still going to hit so poor shots and stuff like that. So it's, it's hard. <laughs> and, and as you well know, most of the guys out, I mean, out, you know, gotten me friendly with, with Tommy Armour the third he's like you know everyone's injured at this point out there you know if you've played 25 30 years professionally all over the world or on the PGA tour there's there's aches and pains in the body by the time you're 55 or talking to Kelk you know yeah. like you, they've swung you guys have swung so hard for so long that every yeah. it's, everyone's injured at some level out there pretty much that's very very true yeah, no, but unfortunately, this player had severe problems with yeah. his body, and uh, but then, and that's no fun for for a player of uh, his caliber uh, to do it and stuff. And uh, but anyway, yeah. it, it is what it is. It's it's just work on it. But I I enjoy it, and uh, I welcome anyone who's listening. Take contact with me. We're going to give you the contact details later on. I, I always love to help people with golf and give back to the game of golf as well. So, well, and that's, yeah, next but, segment, um, yeah, like the corporate outings you do. I know you do a ton of those, and then, you know, if, and we'll definitely, after this segment, let people know how to get a hold of you, but do you, what do you sort of try to bring to the clients and the people that are out there, you know, when you do, you know, do an outing or do work for corporations or an outing for the day, like what's, what do you try to let those players leave with when they spend a day with you? Well, the the big thing is I've been hired by a corporation to do a job of entertaining their clients. Number one, make sure that they are having such a great golf day that they want to buy more products or at least sustain what they do buy. Never go back. <laughs> kind of like if they're invited to a golf uh, corporate outing with me, they should be so happy that they want to buy more products from from the person that they are interacting with in the company that invited them. That's my that's my goal. And obviously during the day I tell stories. Uh, uh, I I tell stories. Uh, I show them a clinic where I have a very easy system, and they, I can explain it quite shortly here also. Every shot over 50 yards, in my mind, as I pull the club head back, I go back in my head. And as I hit the ball, I say hit in my head. So back hit on every shot over 50 yards. 
when I putt and I hit, hit pitches and chip shots, I go one, two. So I, I say one in my brain as I pull the club head back and I say two as I hit it. And believe me or not, but there's a lot of pros that do very similar, simple formula to play good golf. We, we kind of look at the target, react to the target, stand up, and just back hit or one, two, and go. And, and when you watch amateurs, was that easy? Was that it, easy to follow? It's you? very easy. <laughs> yes. Well, because like I always think golf swing same thing. It's sort of like essentially I'm just trying to turn, turn right, like load up, yeah, accelerate yeah. going forward, right? Make sure I'm accelerating and turn, right? I mean that's I try to think of it as you know that direction or you know I try to simplify my golf swing as easy as I can kind of make it, right? We're not going to get overly yeah. complex. And I'm guessing when you work with a bunch of you know. Uh, clients or at a, at a corporate outing, you probably see some golf swings that you could probably correct quite easily or help them with their short game of simplifying it down, right? Sometimes just simple is better. And, and I'm sure you bring yeah. that to the clients as well a little bit where they, they work with you and they kind of leave a little bit of a better golfer and some new ideas of how to play a little bit better. Yeah, you you, you wouldn't imagine how much just this tip of one, two, help players because it's a subconscious it's like a conscious thought that you put in your brain just before you play back hit or one two and the the amateurs they they react very very quickly towards that if but sometimes if i have a this is getting a little bit more technical but if i have a that works really well at least with right brain dominant per uh, players but if I have a left brain dominant person who's like a, a, a chief technical officer or chief financial officer or a lawyer by trade, yeah. and they are very much left brain dominant, my uh, just saying back hit or one two won't work with them. You need to give them more of an instruction of saying this is the position you need to be in, and then you can play great. Yeah, get get the club to here. Weight goes to here, yeah. Like a one, like an almost instruction manual in their head to follow the rules. Yeah, but but that's left brain dominant personalities. Right. Yeah, I so would and that, that's part of my philosophy too. So I have I have a couple of things that I use. I try to simplify the game. The game is very very simple if you understand that the there's only two opponents as well. It's the golf course and yourself. That's it. Nothing else matters. Yourself and the golf course. Yeah, you can't control you what the other guys doing. That, you right? win <laughs> most times. <laughs> right, right. No, you can't control the other person. Right, you can no. just play as low a score as you can. That. Yeah, and and you can actually, in in a way, I, I I recommend all players to not look at the leaderboard, especially in the beginning of their career, um, and and look at the leaderboard where they are because they might not look upon themselves as winners. And then if they see themselves in the lead by two or three shots, it's so easy that they start tanking. So it's just better to not look at the leaderboard at all. Even coming down on Sunday, back nine? Even coming back down on Sunday, no. Uh, Don't look. Play the game as hard as you can and uh, to the best of your ability and then look where you are after 18 or 72 holes. You like that Uh, mindset You might. You might want to have a caddy that doesn't do my story. I won a tour on the Corn Ferry Tour, uh, um, 2009. Yeah, 2009. So <laughs> it's funny because I played the last hole and my caddy kind of pushed me. I, I hit the third shot on the par five over the green and then I chipped it down to maybe three feet and he said, you better make that one. I was like, oh, oh, okay. (laughs) And and I won the tournament by four or five or six shots. Oh, he okay. All right. Well, (laughs) he was was still pushing with me. Yeah, he was still messing with me. (laughs) He was just messing with me. Are you still trying to play on the Champions Tour a little bit? Is that desire still there to get out there and mix it up with those guys used to compete against? Yes, it is. The, the, The big thing was last year. Uh, I did uh, over 40 corporate days last year, and it took away 
uh, me from Monday qualifying into a lot of events. And it's the same this year so far. Uh, but it might change here in September, October, or, or August, September, October. I hope to play at least a few to to several Monday qualifiers uh, and see what I can do. But I'm definitely going to play the Q School uh, for Champions Tour. Does it? How long does it take you to to kind of get you know from casual golf, corporate outing golf to to tournament golf? Is that is that a month for you to work on it to get kind of ready, or is it click back pretty quick with all the experience? You know, you've had what 600 tour events around the world. Like, is it is it come back pretty quick? I I can probably get um, I can I can get my golf in shape pretty good golf shape within a week to two, I would say. Uh, but physically, I, I, it's unfortunately a little bit longer. I, I, I didn't have a good COVID. I put on some weight and everything like that. So that's got to come off <laughs> before I start playing really good golf. So again. Yeah, a little bit more gym time and all that good stuff now? Um, more gy- more, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. It comes with it later. Yeah, yeah, and and diet, diet, or diet, shouldn't say that, but eating healthy yeah. and stuff. Yeah, diets don't uh, and, work, and, right? It's it's got to just no, be no, eating diet. healthy and portion control and getting your you, you know getting it all. Cause it does it. make a difference, right? If 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 you're stronger in the core and legs and all that stuff, it it makes a difference yeah. out there. Did did you work yeah. out oh, a lot? Yeah. In, in, uh, back throughout in the day? my career, for yeah. sure, all all the time, all the all time, the time. nonstop. Yeah, and I was part of the Swedish. I was part of the Swedish. Um, uh, kind of uh, golf mentality, the school of healthy. And, and uh, so I worked out since I was 14, 15 years old, uh, a lot. Uh, and before it, you started talking about the Tigers, started getting all the players to physically fit and everything, I, I, I was working out before that. So the Swedish guys kind of had it figured out early that you could use this from other, yeah. you know, because when I played college golf in the, you know, mid nineties. I mean, we weren't told to lift any weights at all in ninety three or ninety. Like it'd be bad, right? Like you know. No, I, I started a lifting little. weights 84, 84, 85. Uh, and That's that was interesting. part of also. I, I was playing uh, soccer at a high level and for for boys. Uh, and uh, so we were. I started working out with my so- for my soccer before golf when I was fourteen. Right, and then kept that and, going and all the way through with weights. Well, yeah, because you kind of yeah. think about the Swedish players, right? Like, Henrik's a frame. He's a big guy. Jesper's always been in great yeah. shape. You know, Freddie Jock in great shape. Alex Noren's built like a brick. I wonder if that's a part of that, you know, this that heritage that athletes first and then that you're doing golf in a real athletic way, right? Because I'm thinking of all the, 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 the guys kind of from – that you may have known or competed against coming up from uh, Sweden. They're all yeah. in good shape. Yeah, no, you, you even have Rick, Richard S. Johnson. Yeah, he was uh, he's still like out legs. there, but he, he's yeah. had problems with his neck over his career. But to to make sure he stays healthy, he, he's always worked out and he's super fit and everything. So the uh, yeah, no, uh, most Swedes, uh, and I would say that's that's probably a strength for the Swedish ladies golf. And uh, I don't know what what's happening with the water in Sweden right now with. I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a lot of good, great, young female golfers coming from Sweden. I would be very surprised if we don't have a top one in the world within five, six, seven years. Yeah, it's, you know, good athletes come, come from that country, no question about it. Yeah. Um, if they do want to get a hold of you for coaching on the mental side or doing outings, like what's the best way for, for people to get a hold of you? So if you have paper and pen... It's my name, Matthias with T H M A T H I S Gronberg with an M G R O N uh, with an N, not M N as in Nick Gr- Matthias Gronberg at AOL dot com, and then uh, my cell phone as well. No problem. Seven three two three one nine seven five two nine, and that's that's me. Easy. Got to ask you one last one, live tour stuff. I mean, it's just because it's been such a story. Oh, what's, yeah. What's, what's your view on it? 
My view is after talking to several business people that I, that I value their input and everything, they say the players should go and, and take the money. Uh, and why not? Uh, if you're struggling in your business, uh, like several of these players that have gone and they get a lucrative contract deal, why wouldn't they take it? If you have a business in the U.S. and you're struggling with it and someone comes and throws money at you, are you not going to sell? You're going to sell. Yeah. doesn't matter. And, and th then you have it that 21 corporations do business uh, with the PGA Tour that also do business with Saudi Arabia. Well, of course, because the world's all so globalized the, all, anymore, that's going to be right. All, yes, I'm with you yeah, on this. And all the right. governments, all the governments, the politicians, all the governments of the world do business with Saudi Arabia. That's correct. So it's, I think it's hypocritical to say that we can't, but I do think that the PGA Tour uh, need to do some blocking, but they they went overboard. They They could have maybe worked out a schedule where the players would play four events this year, maybe instead of eight for the other tour, and then play maybe eight events out of the 14 or seven out of the 14 events for, for next year. And, and so not play a full schedule on that tour. Who knows? But I, I do think they're, they're, we shouldn't criticize them too much to go for the money. Because that's what, like, Graham McDowell is a great guy. He's been all over the world chasing the money, as he says. And and he didn't really look into too much where the money is coming from. But I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big fund that, that is putting in the money, and why not go? The other thing, uh, well, it's two parts. As you well know, you guys are always just, you know, with no guarantee in, that, in professional golf, right? You're, you're one wrist injury away from being done. Right, so to have guaranteed money, I can understand that. Yeah. Right. There's a there's no yeah. security in what you guys have done, and and the other part, I I still can't quite wrap. And I don't know, you may know more of the details as a former PGA Tour player, but I never understood if you're an independent contractor, like why you would even need to get a release. Like I think that's going to be an interesting topic that gets probably resolved in the courts of how can you have technically control of somebody. But you're not an employee. Yeah, and you're not supposed to have control over somebody who's a 1099. <laughs> exactly. So how does that yeah. shake out, right? I never understood, even before all this happened, where if you wanted to go get an appearance fee over on the European Tour, why did you need a release? As long as you played the minimum tournaments the PGA Tour wanted you to play, I never understood that, of how yeah. can you have it both ways? And I don't know if you have any thoughts on that as a former PGA Tour player of, you know... Never quite added up to me. I always thought I was baffling a little bit. No, you're true, and I, I, the, the problem is that the, the problem is that the PJ Tour, with the tournaments, you obviously want to say that there's a possibility that a Rory McIlroy will come in, or Dustin Johnson, or Graham McDowell, like that these players would show up because they are PJ Tour players and they're not playing some somewhere else. Uh, so it's easier to sell the tournaments, and I, I, I do think it's 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 not good for golf. What's going on with Live Golf? Uh, just to clarify that, I think it's it's wrong that someone uh, from Asia gets invited, or some of the players that I've played uh, and are shooting a twenty over par or ten right. over par in three rounds and getting paid one hundred twenty thousand dollars. That is just wrong, in my book. And and playing exhibition game, we're we're gonna see a dramatic change in the world ranking. Don't believe that Dustin Johnson and Paul Casey and uh, Bryson DeChambeau that they're gonna be world players according to the world ranking in four years from now or three years. They might be completely gone if they don't play well in the majors. They they they're gonna have a hard time. But I think they've had to accept that. That's part of the hundred million or whatever they're getting, right? Like they may never. Yeah. Get, right. Like yeah. You're, you're you're saying but, I'm. But, gonna... it, but it is hard for them to give. That's going to be hard, and I don't think they fully thought of that. 
Like they thought that maybe we're going to get, we're going to be so strong that we can strong arm the PGA tour to, to let us play now. And stuff. like, it would have been a better solution if, if they would have, um, play 72 holes with no cut or with the cut and, and kind of work towards becoming uh, world ranking points events, but, and, and increase the field sizes and stuff. So I, they're, they're just going the wrong way with exhibition. I think the, the, and it's not good for golf. It's going to be very interesting to see how this shakes out. And the other thing I thought that was really interesting, all of a sudden, where did the PGA Tour come up with all this money to, <laughs> why wasn't it out there before? I mean, right? They, they come up with the extra funding for yeah. the players now. Well, I always said, I always thought the players, you know, if John Rahm's making, on the, on the the not counting off the course money, but if he's making 6 or $7 million on the golf course, he's one of the most grossly underpaid athletes in the world based upon what, you know, European football or our football players here or baseball play, like, think of every other major sport and what those TV contracts and media right contracts are worth. John Rahm has yeah. to be worth more than $6 million a year. But here's the thing. It, it, looking back, you know exactly what you sign up for. You know what you're signing up for. You're just a number in the PGA Tour business. Uh, I know we're owners or, or, or owning it, Kind of like as a member of the tour, you own the tour. But in re- in reality, it, PGA Tour is like a corporation and you work for them and you're just a number uh, if you're not like a Phil Mickelson or, or John Rahm or something, then you may be more valuable. But you're still just a number. And that's what like Dustin Johnson, Bryson DeChambeau or all the players that are leaving for uh, Live Golf, the Saudi Arabian Golf Tour, uh, the they're just a number. They're going to be forgotten, unfortunately, after four, five, six years of not playing. If they don't play well in the majors, if they keep right. on playing well in the majors, they're going to get enough world ranking points so they can stay. But every two years, if you don't perform in within a two year period, you're completely gone. If you don't play other world ranking points events. And, and then, like you said, knowing oh. what you're signed up for, then you have to be comfortable with that on the other side, right? That is a consequence. You have to be comfortable with that, yeah. But uh, but it, uh, but I I still think they believe that they're going to have a, a way back yeah. in. Maybe they can play on the DP World Tour, uh, some events, but why would you play then in smaller prize purses and everything? You, you, they're not going to. They're not looking back. They're, they're not going to come back. But it's sad. Because chasing titles, we didn't, none of us players went into it for the money. We went in, just like Justin Thomas and Rory McIlroy is pushing, we went in to win titles, create, become uh, uh, well known for your golf game. That, that's what was driving us, not the amount of money. I don't care if I won 10 million in my career or 20. I would live the same kind of lifestyle anyway. And that's what I'm getting like John Rahm. Yeah, he is, he is underpaid as a sports athlete probably, but he's still getting six or seven million plus plus a year. It's enough. Yes, but it, is, but it seems like the PGA Tour, yes, and he said that, right? Like, I already have enough money I could retire now because they make so much off the golf yeah. course, right? But uh, I just found it interesting that all of a sudden they found this money to increase these purses at the end of the year for the, for the best players out there. Yeah, and I, but I, I think they had to do something. They had to, yes. They, yeah, right. they, had, they had to do something. And this was something, and um, uh, and I th- I believe I saw a number. I don't know if it's true or not, but the the PJ Tour has somewhere around 230 million in reserves, and I don't know if that's including the 50 or or without the 50. But there there's a lot of money. But the PJ Tour is a big corporation. It's like four, five, six hundred people employed. It, it's a big business, uh, and the PJ Tour have been great towards me. In my career, I'm I'm going to be. But at the same time, if the Saudi League came and offered me a big contract, I probably would leave. Right. You know, I'm I, looking at where I am in my career and everything. 
uh, and and that's what every player. But I, I do hope that these young players, some of the young players, don't take the money. And it was so strong. I, I read some kind of story. There was an amateur player that got offered a, a lot of money to go, and uh, luckily he said no, and uh, he wants to try the PJ Tour way uh, instead. And uh, the yeah. Well, and I can flip around my own argument, right, which I can do back and forth, kind of lawyering the thing. Well, right, it means something. You have four wins on the, the DP World Tour, right? Those are – that that's a bit of history. Yeah. You won on that tour, a really good, you know, elite tour. You've got four of them yeah. on there. I mean, you right, You, you, you it's not an exhibition. There's a cut. You're playing hard. Like, you own a part of the European Tour history with four of them. That, I think maybe yeah. that's kind of what the, you're talking about as well, right? That you can't go back and replace that. You've earned those wins, and they're special as they that's should be. That's very true. Yeah, right. That's very right. very true. Yeah, you played in an era with. I mean, I don't know if the European, you know, you won that European tour was. I, I don't think there's much difference between the PGA Tour and European Tour. The guys you had to beat in that era to play with. I mean, it was some. There were some studs out there, and you, you, you know, you, you've got a part of the history of four of them on there, which I think I agree with you from a victory standpoint. I think it means a little bit more than the one Brandon Grace just won from a competition standpoint, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. right. It's not the same. It's, it's a you know, Brandon Grace has you know played well and he won a bunch of money, but it's not like a it's not like winning the British Masters. I'm sorry, it's not. No, 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 it's no, just no, not. no, I'm no, sorry, not like, even close. I, and I know, I know the fans. That that's what's the worst is that it, this is split, splitting up the fans of golf in two camps or three camps. And uh, the more the more different tours you have, the the worse golf will be. I think with uh, the fans, because th- there was someone who said like the John Deere felt like a nationwide or one ferry tour tournament, and I'm looking at it. No, it's John Deere Classic and. There's new players coming up, new players that are going to be superstars, yep, like yeah, Scotty Scheffler and Sam Burns and Colin Montgomery, uh, uh, Colin, uh, no, um, um, Colin Morikawa. Is it Colin Morikawa? Yeah, yep. Colin Morikawa and Sanders Shuffle and all these players that they're, they're coming up. They're, it's going to be new players that are coming up, and, and we're going to have new Ricky Fowler superstars and stuff like that. Well, yeah, or look at JT Poston, just because that's our home tournament, right? I, I I love that tournament. I've actually watched you play out there before. That's a, that's our that's our home tournament. Yeah. We call it our fifth major, and you know that's a huge for JT. Can I complain? Poston. Can I complain a little bit? Sure. I wish JT. I wish JT Poston would 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 celebrate his birdies a little bit more. Yeah, <laughs> it was he a little is. bit flatlining. Yeah, he's I think just like flatlining. Seri- I think the seriousness of the tournament was getting to him, maybe, but uh, or maybe he is that way always. But I I, I know we're, we we celebrate different personalities and stuff, but. Come on, give me some kind of smile and happiness. I think that's how he plays. But, like, I was just thinking, like, yeah. you know, talking about, like, what the tournaments can do, right? Like, it's – that's a big deal for him to get. Like, we talk about being a multiple tour winner, right? Now he's done it twice. Yeah. And then now he's, what, I think, 20th on the FedEx list. Now he's going to play in the Open Championship, right? That's a springboard. Yeah. So I don't think you can discount the John Deere Classic. There is still a shit ton of doors that open from that second win for him. Confidence, oh, yeah. open, For sure. big check, right? More, ex- it's not a, it's not a corn fairy tour event. I, I, and I hear the criticism of the field, but no, but th- 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 this is just a fan that w- was throwing it out there, like, right. no, but I yeah, disagree. That, with that, it it right. just felt that way because the fans want to know the names of the players that are in the league, and you and I will know the names a little bit, but it will take time for new players to emerge like Scotty Scheffler, even though he had won maybe two events in the beginning, the, the, the fans didn't really know who it was, but now when he's won four or five, it's easier. Yes. Yeah. And like us being golf nuts, right? Like we knew who he was coming out of college and watching him on the corn Ferry tour and getting his card from that direction. So you kind of take note of, wow, this kid came out and, you know, in one yeah. season on the corn Ferry tour has got his PGA tour card. And with that pedigree, this kid's going to be pretty good, but even took him a while, right? He didn't win at first out there. He kind of still no. had to learn at that next level. I, I love watching some of these, you know, which would be considered smaller market PGA tour events to kind of see, 
young talent. Or like last year, you know, it's kind of cool to see like Lucas Glover kind of fix the putting and, you know, get a win in his 40s. You know, it's good to see an elite yeah. player like that kind of come back and still have it. So those, I love those tournaments, um, you know, of, of seeing some, you know, old guys kind of finding it and a lot of young talent coming up. So I, I love the John Deere Classic. That's our fifth major. Yeah. It's our home event. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I Unfortunately, I saw that uh, Claire Peterson, who's been running that tournament, is retiring. He's going to be a player liaison now. Yes. But he ran that for many, many years, and I'm very grateful. I got an invite in 99 to play the John Deere Classic, my first PGA Tour event that I played in. So I'm very happy with that. And it's good <laughs> good people. I'm sure the fans were always great to you, right? It's just a nice It's a nice oh, yeah. community, and they appreciate the guys coming out there to play, you know, out to the Quad Cities. It's like a big deal out here because I'm, I'm yeah. out in the cornfields more closer to that area, and it's like a huge thing for us to have that event out here, so... Like I said, it's yeah, a f- and I, re- I remember how fun we, w- Michelle Wee came and played. Yeah. And it was like mayhem. That was mayhem too. That was fun to see. It was a lot of people that came out. Like people, uh, some of the pros were uh, complaining that, oh, why do we have girls or women playing in our event? But at the same time, she brought out single handedly like 10,000 fans that day. Exactly. Uh, for the two days. And, and I've, I've played actually with a, 12 year old pro a uh, 12 year old golfer from China when I played in on the Omega European Masters one year and it was so funny to play he looked like Tiger Woods everything he did was Tiger Woods it was he was like a mini copy of Tiger Woods at 12 it was amazing to see he he didn't make the cut but he he was so good he um, he he had two doubles early on in the in the tournament and pretty much shot like four over par in 36 holes at that but age at 12. That's insane uh, it, it was amazing to see it well, was amazing to see i can't tell you how much i appreciate the conversation this was great i love the insights you know and thanks for giving the contact info out for for people listening who want to get a little bit better at golf and in in or if they have a company that want to have you come out and and you know help their clients out and have a wonderful day it's it's fantastic so thank you so much i really really appreciate it yeah no problem at all i had a great time it's it's always nice to to remember good memories from the golf course and everything like that so but uh, if if it's a corporate day, I promise one thing: let's let's do more sales for you. That that's my promise. I love it. Thanks, Matthias. Appreciate okay. it. Take care. Bye bye.